right. Praise the Lord. Good to see you tonight. Uh, we are a little low on numbers tonight. Sharon, my wife, as you know, she is up in Canada visiting family. She hasn't been up there in a while, but so I miss her. Uh, but she'll be back on Friday. And uh, But let's all stand to our feet tonight. It's so good to have Jennifer Ward and her sons here today. Let's welcome them here. It's so good to have them here traveling through, going to the ark. But uh, let, we came to worship, amen? So let's worship him tonight. Thank you, Lord. When I close my eyes, I can see. touch your face when I bow my knees I stand before you and Christ is for me awake my soul preparing entrance for your glory
touch us, come and refresh us, come and feel us, Lord, today. Oh, my life is not my own, my life is not my own, to you I belong, oh, I give myself, I give myself to Myself to you. Oh, one more time. Oh, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself. I give myself to you. Oh, I give myself away. Oh, I give myself away. So you. You know, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul described the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that passage, the high calling that every one of us have is to know Him and to be used by Him. To know Him and to be used by Him. And the only way we can truly really know Him, like He wants us to know Him, is by us and it began the moment of salvation by us saying Lord here I am I'm yours take my sin and give me your righteousness take my failure and give me your victory take my darkness and give me your light it's the divine exchange that we live the rest of our life with every single day of our life we're not getting saved all over again but every day we are reckoning ourselves dead and alive through Jesus and what he's done for us and our calling that we have, I just want to encourage you tonight that you call it, you are called, God's hand is upon you. You may never stand behind a pulpit to preach, but God's hand is upon you. He's called you, and He's called you more than anything else to know Him, to know Him. And we do that primarily in prayer and in, re- in, 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 in His Word. That's why the disciples in Acts chapter 6, they the apostles that is, they said to the multitudes as there was a division in the body, they said, we must give ourselves to prayer and to the study of God's Word. That can't be overstated. So we know Him primarily through prayer and the study of His Word, knowing Him through His Word, and that's how He uses us as well. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that tonight, that He loves us. His hand is upon us. He's called us. Praise the Lord. You may be seated tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Mm. Well, the Lord is faithful, and I'm so thankful for that. Praise God. It's so good to see every one of you. And as I said earlier, some are out because of sickness. My wife Sharon's out because she's in Canada visiting family, and she hasn't been up to Canada in a long time. So she's up there. And, uh, but we're here, and Jesus is here. And that's what matters. Amen. <laughs> praise God and uh, praise the Lord. Um, there, there are, you know, there are some in the church who are not, who are not, uh, that have physical ailments. And I just want to pray for them tonight. And maybe you tonight, you've got a physical ailment uh, or just infirmity in the body. And uh, we want to pray right now. The Lord would bring healing and strength and let his healing virtue flow. 
And so can we agree together right now in prayer? Let's pray. Father, right now we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that by your stripes we are healed. Lord, we stand upon your word. We stand upon your finished work, Lord Jesus. And we thank you that, yes, Lord, by your stripes we are healed. And, Lord, I ask you right now and believe you for the healing, your healing virtue to flow from heaven and touch every person, Lord, whether they're here or watching online or they're not at all. God, I pray that your healing virtue would flow to them right now in the name of Jesus from head to toe and let strength, your strength, flow throughout their body. Let the weak areas become strong. Let the ailed areas become healed in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. And let the wrong areas become right and corrected and we declare it in the name of Jesus we believe it Lord we thank you that you are our healer you are Jehovah Rapha our healer and you are Jehovah Jireh our provider and we thank you Lord for your healing virtue we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit we thank you Lord we thank you for your word tonight for it is settled, hallelujah, you are our healer, and we look to you tonight, Jesus. We look to you tonight, God. You are our provider. Lord, it is settled. We look to you, and we stand upon the rock tonight. Lord, we have a firm foundation in you, Jesus, and we thank you for that, hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Father. We thank you. Oh, we thank you, Jesus, that you are our firm foundation. Yes, Lord, you are our rock that we stand upon tonight oh yes Lord let the power of your Holy Spirit flow like a river Lord here and even those that are watching or maybe not even watching but Lord let your river flow to them in the name of Jesus yes Lord in the name of Jesus for it is not by might nor by power but by your spirit says the Lord and we are your people called by your name redeemed by your blood and we give you praise tonight. We give you glory and honor. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord, it is settled, Lord. It is settled in heaven. It's settled here on earth. It is settled in our hearts, oh, Lord. You are God alone. Yes, Lord, and we worship you. Jesus, you are Savior. You are Redeemer. Yes, and we look to you tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. He said in his word that our foot shall not slip or stumble. Hallelujah. I thank the Lord for that tonight. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, praise God. You know, one of the areas in that, that the, um, I'm not, I don't mean to sound critical or the cup is half empty, but um, one of the areas that the church in general as a whole uh, is weaken is in, it's weaken in in knowing what to do when when the Holy Spirit is moving uh, the, the church and just the ministry in general has become such an observation thing it's become such a uh, entertainment thing even e e even if there's no strobe lights or smoke machine all you don't have to have all that to have an entertaining spirit in a church. An entertaining spirit is when people just come to be entertained. And get this, even the, even, the, uh, the, even the presence of God can be a form of entertainment for people. And the Word of God can be a form of entertainment for people. And I, and I didn't mean to chase this rabbit, but I'm on it, so I'll just stay here for a minute. Even we, sit, we read about in the book of Ezekiel, and, and Ezekiel, and I'm paraphrasing, and I don't remember the exact reference, but the Bible tells us, or Ezekiel wrote it, the Lord spoke to him and said this to Ezekiel. He said that the people view you like an entertainer. I get this. Ezekiel was a prophet speaking to them the word of God. And they said they view you like someone who comes in and sings a song 
and and entertains and then they leave and the people clap their hands on you know during the you know they clap but then they leave and but Ezekiel this is what the Lord told him I want you to know this that that is how the people are viewing you they're viewing you in that way and it had nothing to do with what Jer I'm sorry with what Ezekiel was doing he was doing what was right and the amazing thing about Ezekiel's ministry is that Ezekiel was not one of those prophets that uh, that was some kind of charismatic, you know, someone that people would just gravitate towards. God called him to do some very unusual things, uh, Ezekiel. So he was not a normal prophet. But my point is this, is that even, even in times of old, in, 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 as it regards the word of God, and it regards his people, that, that, that the moving of the Holy Spirit, sometimes we don't know what to do. And, and my, prayer for, my prayer for myself and for all of us, because we're growing together, my prayer for this church and for myself is that we, when we sense just even the gentle moving of the Holy Spirit, that it doesn't take some acts to mighty rushing wind to get our attention but it just takes the still small voice of the holy spirit to get our attention and when we sense the moving of the holy spirit we won't sit there and just you know well i wonder what's going to happen but we will we will enter in we will say here we will we'll basically open up our sails and say move me move me oh god like a ship move me lord move me by your spirit that's what my prayer is that we would know that we would know praise god and i'm so uh, i'm just so thankful for you uh tonight praise god i'm thankful for the presence of god turn your bibles if you would please the book of revelation chapter one and we we looked at this last week and we're going to look at it again not the same exact thing but and i don't know how long we're going to be in the book of revelation i don't pr i don't plan on doing going through the whole book, you know, um, I've done a series on, on YouTube, so, uh, and, and on YouTube, it's 48 videos on the book of uh, Revelation, and uh, some might wonder, wow, that's, that's a lot of video, I mean, it took that, well, it's 22 chapters, <laughs> and if we put that on Tuesday nights, that would be almost, that would be pretty much a year in the book of Revelation, and I don't, I don't plan on doing that, but I do, I just feel in my heart, you know, that, that we're going to be here uh, and we're going to take a look at some things in the book of Revelation. And tonight we're going to begin with verse 1 and I'm going to read through verse 3. It begins with John writing, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm, boy, that's good right there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all the things that he saw. And he said, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And tonight I just want to minister for uh, until about 8 o'clock. I, I want to minister on the revelation of Jesus Christ the revelation of Jesus Christ so let's pray tonight father we're just we're just so thankful for your presence we thank you for your love Lord we thank you Jesus that you left heavenly glory to become a man you gave your life for us and Lord so we would give our life to you we thank you for that tonight we thank you for your sacrifice we thank you for your word and Lord I ask you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to make your word real to us Lord give us understanding and we just give you all the praise and all the glory. And everyone said amen and amen. Praise God. You know, the, the, uh, often the, the book Revelation, even in Bibles, in, in any doesn't matter what Bible you're using, the translation that is, or, or publisher, normally the book Revelation just sim is just simply called Revelation. We know it is that. Have you read the book of Revelation? There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's just our the way that we've done it over the years, but the, the God-given title for this book is right in the first few words of it when it says, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And the, you know, the book of Revelation, is, I, I, I think I mentioned it last week, but I'll mention it again, that the book of Revelation is one of those books, 
one of the main books in the Bible that a lot of times Christians don't read. Uh, or if they do, they'll read maybe a first few verses or a, a, some, you know, uh, uh, spot verses here and there. But they, if they try to read through it, they get confused because of the massive amount of symbolism that's used. And they'll go back to reading the Psalms or something that they can, you know, think they, we identify with. And I understand that. Uh, and I, I get that because the book of Revelation is often viewed and presented as a book of mystery. And it's even said sometimes behind pulpits. I've heard it said behind pulpits. It's a book of mystery, and we really, do, we really can't understand it. We don't know what this book means. And there are so many preachers. I, boy, I'm sounding really pessimistic tonight. But there's so many preachers that don't even minister on the book of Revelation. They don't even touch it with a 10-foot pole. And they will actually tell people that. I'm not ministering on the book of Revelation because it's just we don't, we don't understand. Nobody really understands what it means. And so I'm just going to leave it there. We know that Jesus is coming again. And there are some who even don't even mention that today. But, you know, I'm thankful that I've ministered on it recently. I'm thankful that, that a part of our hope that we have in Jesus is not only that he came the first time, but that he's coming again. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for that? He said in John 14, I will come again. If I go, if I go I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and, that, and, and I'm coming again that where I am, you may be also. That's a part of the great hope that we have in Jesus, that he's coming again for us. And, and when he does in the rapture, we shall be changed. Hallelujah. All the effects of the fall are going to be gone. No more sickness. No more ailments. No more weakness. All of that is gone. No more bills. Oh, thank the Lord. And so, but it's viewed, again, the revelation is viewed as a, as a, as a mystery. Now, I will bring this out. The word revelation, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation is the Greek word it's pronounced apocalypsis, apocalypsis. You've heard of the word apocalypse before, right? Apocalypse, I'm sure you have. Apocalypse, uh, the world uses that word apocalypse uh, in, in, in various different settings. And normally it's like end of the world, the world's going to be destroyed, the apocalypse is coming, okay? <laughs> or the stock market's going to crash, everybody's, and, you know, the, the apocalypse. And it's always used in a negative connotation. But get this, when the, when the Bible used the word revelation, normally it's used in the positive way. For example, this right here, the revelation, the apocalypsis the, uh, uh, of Jesus Christ. That word apocalypsis, it means to unveil. It means to uncover. It's like the lifting of a curtain. And, mention, and look at this, it's the revelation, it's the unveiling of what? not really what, of who, of Jesus Christ. And so, it's, uh, I find it so interesting that this book, the last book of the Bible is called, the, this is the title, The Unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's almost like that, those words could be put in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible, you know what the Bible is? The Bible is... The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of God's redemption plan for us. And, and it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. You know, the, Paul told us in, Rem, in Romans chapter 1, in the book of Psalms is, is filled with this, that we see God's existence, the reality of God in creation. We see the reality of God even on our own, in our own self, in our, in our own conscious, Paul said. And the Bible says in Psalms that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Why? It's because it's so obvious. It's so obvious. I mean, the reality of God is all around us. But I bring that up to, say, to get to this point. That is great of a revealer of the, of the reality of God that creation is. I mean, the trees, the animal life, but even more than anything, human beings, us, uh, and are conscious as great as, as a revealer of God that those are, they do not tell the gospel. 
They do not explain the gospel plan. So we shouldn't make a lot of that. We shouldn't make a lot of creation because God did that. And God, that's in his word. God says, those things reveal my glory. And for a child of God, for you and I, I think we can take, and I'm chasing a rap, but we, we, we can, I know for myself, the older I get, I just look at, crea I look at the trees, I look at the birds, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I'll never forget the words of my grandmother, Cornell, and living on, uh, they, they lived on a farm and had a cow farm, and I go up there several times a year, and especially in the, in the summertime, the birds would be out there playing, singing, playing, singing, <laughs> and she loved the sound of birds. She and she could whistle. She just liked the whistle, and but she loved about the sound of birds. I never forget her saying, "Bobby, the birds are singing praises to God. Amen. They're singing praises to God." I will never forget that. The birds are singing praise to God. So here I am. I'm 51 years old. And you know what I'm going to tell my grandchildren? The birds are singing praises to God. <laughs> little Evelyn, little Arthur, the birds are singing praises to God. And so that's wonderful. But I tell you, it's the word of God that explains the gospel. That's how important this Bible is from Genesis to Revelation. That's how important it is. We do not realize how blessed that we are to have from Genesis to Revelation. So here is the last book of the Bible, and it's entitled The Unveiling, The Uncovering of Jesus Christ. And, um, and so when we, when we read the book of Revelation, I want, I want you to let this sink in. Again, just the title itself, the God-given title. When we read the book of Revelation, we are reading the unveiling of Jesus. The reason why that's important is because we can sometimes get it in our mind, or and let me say it this way, Jesus can get lost, or we, in our own minds, we can get, we, Jesus can get lost, the, the reality of the unveiling of Jesus here in this book can get lost with all of what we don't know, the symbolism, the, dra the, the seven-headed dragon, you know, in, in Revelation chapter 13 and the, and the beast come, coming out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13. And all, these, all this symbolism and we can get caught up in what we don't know and lose what we can read and what we do know. And so I want to encourage you that the book of Revelation is, is all about Jesus. And I, wanna, I want you to go to a verse, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. And maybe little Sid can get that, put that up on the screen. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. This is the very end of, of Revelation. There it is. And John, okay, the, John has, it's not an angel, not an angelic visitation, but one of the elders is speaking to him, and, and it says this, and I fell, that's John, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that, you do, do, uh, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Oh, what a, I, I'll stop right here. What a statement that is. Don't worship me. Worship God. And then he says this. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's a powerful statement. This whole verse is powerful. But that statement there is what I was getting at. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It could be understood this way, that the, that the testimony of the person and the work of Jesus is the essence, is the centerpiece of Bible prophecy. In other words, in other words prophecy is all about Jesus. Bible prophecy, it's all about Jesus. It's not about figuring out what the blood moons are or what the, what the total eclipse means. It's not, a, it's not about trying to figure out, as I've mentioned recently, it's not about chasing signs to try to get an inside track, to, you know, people trying to find out exactly, okay, Jesus is going to come back in a month or he's going to come back in a year and we know it because of this and that. It's not about that. We're not chasing signs. We're chasing Jesus. Why? It's because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so this whole book, Revelation, and the whole Bible, of course, is all about the unveiling of Jesus. And, um, 
he, uh, I want to mention this as well. You're in Revelation 19. And uh, go to Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. And I, I, I want to read these two verses because um, in the book of Revelation, one of the things that we see, we see all of the major doctrines of the Bible revealed in the book of Revelation. I'm going to say it again. All of the major doctrines or teachings of the Bible, we find it in the book of Revelation. We find, and if you don't know what, the, what does that mean, all the major doctrines? The doctrine of God. There's one God. We find that, and he's the creator, and there's, and there's false gods. But we find that in, we see that in the book of Revelation. The doctrine of the Savior, we see that in the book of Revelation. The doctrine of angels, we see that in this book. The doctrine of man. Same thing, saying that doctrine of create, we see it all. Doctrine of end time events, of course we see it here. And the and, and list goes on and on. All the major doctrines, we see it in the book Revelation. Another one, I, I should have brought that, the doctrine of God's word. We, it's, it, it's, we see that in verse 2. So I want to read Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. With that said, it's, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. All the major doctrines are found in this book. And at the very end of Revelation, the angel, sorry, John is speaking, and he says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy, of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Then to verse 19. And if anyone takes away from the words of the, of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. You know, I, I bring this up because at the very end, there is a warning that's given. Don't add to it and don't take away. Have you ever heard of those verses before? Okay, don't add to it and don't take away. I'll mention this, and I don't want to chase this rabbit too long, but so often, so often when those two verses are brought up, it's brought up in the sense of Bible translations, primarily King James only. King James only advocates will use these two verses and like a, like a just thump on it that, that if you use any other translation other than the King James, then you are adding or taking away from the Bible. And get this, that is not what this is meaning at all. The King James, and this is not against the King James, okay, not at all. But the King James is a translation, okay? <laughs> so if it was about translations, then, then if it was about that, then, then we're all cooked, okay? <laughs> um, but that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about adding, ultimately, adding to Jesus or taking away from him the revelation of Jesus taking adding to the revelation of Jesus or taking away from the revelation of Jesus because if we add or take away from the revelation of Jesus then we're adding or taking away from the gospel and that really really is at the essence of it don't add or take away from the revelation of Jesus don't add or take away from the from uh, the person and the work of Jesus don't add or take away from that because if you do, then he said, then your name could be taken out of the book of life. And, um, and so I wanted to bring that out about those, about those two verses. Going back to Revelation chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 again. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now this is... So often, these are just introductory statements here, but I want to pick, look at it closely. He said, which God gave to his servants, things which must shortly take place. Now, when we read that, in our, especially in the English, we often, our mind often, often goes to shortly take place. That, that means, you know, in our thinking, we think shortly take place. That means it's going to take place, you know, like one, two, three seconds, four seconds, five, five seconds. Like, like shortly, that's shortly. And we think of it in the sense of duration of time. Now get this, the word shortly is, 
is the Greek word takos, or like not, not tacos, but <laughs> takos. It's, and we get the English, we get the, um, we get the English word uh, tachom- tachometer. You ever heard of a tachometer before? Like in your car, you have an RPM gauge, okay, your RPM, that's a tachometer. It registers not the duration of something, but it registers the how quickly the engine is run. It, it really, it's registering the suddenness of something happening. And get this, the word shortly here, that's what it's referring to. It's not referring to duration of time, it's referring to suddenness of time. In other words, when he comes back, he's going to happen quickly. When the end comes, it's going to happen quickly. You know, one of the, I think one of the signs that we're living, one of the many signs that we're living in the, in the last of the last days, is just look at the world today. Look at the world that we live in today. Everything that happens, exactly, it happens quickly. Now get this. All the, I, I, I've, I've kind of, um, I've switched recently. I cut the cable. It sounds like a commercial, but I cut the cable and I went to streaming and I'm just kind of finding my way. I, uh, we don't have direct TV no more. Don't have Xfinity. I'm just finding free channels, okay, online, okay, <laughs> stuff like that. So I found, I got the, I found the history channel, okay, for free. So I'm watching a few things and I wa- I'm watching a few of the programs and I don't know if they're, internet versions or whatever, but they have a series about different things that made America. And they have one called the food, the food that made America. And then they have other things, buildings or architects that made America, all that kind of stuff. And I've been, I, I've not been watching all the, the ser- episodes, but I've watched several of them. One of the things that, that I found so interesting, among many things about these different things, is that most of what we have today has been invented within the last hundred or a little over a hundred years. Really. Most, even what we eat, most of it has been, has been invented like Nabisco and Betty Crocker and all these things. They haven't been around in the 1500s, okay? <laughs> they just were, they, most of the, like the foods, I'll just bring, I'll use that for example. Most of our common foods and brands were invented from like the 20s to the 40s. That's about 100 years, less than 100 years. And so even the inventions that we have, the cars and, and airplanes and things like that, railroads, those are things that were at the very earliest were in the uh, uh, or early were in the late 1800s and but the time that we're living in everything takes place quick that's a sign of the last day so when the last days comes it's things are going to start happening quickly the coming of or the rapture it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and it and get this even the seven year tribulation period when the seven, we won't be here, but when the seven-year tribulation period begins to happen, it's basically seven years until the end of the world as the world knows it. Because of the second coming of Jesus Christ, when Christ comes at the end, at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, he will come with such power and glory that he will radically change this earth. And this earth will never, ever, ever, ever be the same again. He will begin the thousand-year reign of Christ. He will reign in this earth for his thousand years. That, and the Bible says in Isaiah that, and, and uh, uh, Habakkuk as well, I believe it is, or Zechariah, that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. In other words, after the second coming of Christ, that, that just like it's abnormal to know Jesus now, it will be normal then. And the knowledge of Jesus, people being saved, will be normal then. And it will be abnormal for someone to be immoral. It will be abnormal for someone to curse. It will be abnormal for someone to to lie and to commit adultery. Those things will be abnormal. It's right over our head. My point of bringing up the tribulation period is that we think... You know, seven years, we can think, well, that's that's kind of a long time. But in this... Really, the older you get, the more you realize it's not a long time. And especially in light of eternity, seven years is nothing. 
It's short. And when you read, when, we, when you go through the book of Revelation, those seven years are going to be nonstop judgment of God. I mean, boom, 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 boom. I mean, nonstop. Things are going to be happening. I mean, billions, most likely billions of people will die during the seven-year tribulation period. And the value of human life, we see this in, the, in Revelation, the value of human life will become so cheap. I mean, cheap. And we see that in our day that we're living in. It's one of the, I think that's one of the signs that we realize that, that think we're getting close to the end. Why? It's because the value of human life is so cheap. It doesn't matter. And it's not just the abortion thing. That's a huge thing. But it's not just abortion. It's the, it's the human trafficking that it's, that's on the increase. It's on the rise. And the sex trafficking, which is on the rise, which is an evil that is beyond evil. It's just evil. And then, not just that, but it, in, uh, I'm, I'm, with the sports world, uh, it, we're going back to the gladiator days, basically. And, and so, things are happening quickly. So, John said, things which must shortly take place. And he signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God. And this is John speaking now. I'll, it's very easy to skip over verse 2, but I want to mention something about verse 2. He said, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus and to all things that he saw. Now get this. He said in here, verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God. We know that the book of Revelation, let me back up a bit. This has to do with the development of the canon of Scripture that happened over the first 200 years of the church. Over the first 200 years of the church, the canon, and the word canon speaks of standard, is the word that means standard. The standard of what is scripture, what is Bible, what is God's word was developed over those 200 years. Now the Old Testament had already been established, but the New Testament, it took, it took some time for believers and, and, and ministers and lay people and, and uh, uh, ch uh, again, church leaders to, to grasp, okay, this, this, is, this, this is the word of the Lord over here, but this over here is not. This is a, this is a pseudo word because it, during the first, first century and then he, first, second century as well and on and after that, there were many Pseudo, you know what pseudo means? It means false. There were false gospels that were being written. Uh, false, God, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How do we come up with those? How do, how do we? How do people come up with the believers like ourselves? How do they do it? It's because they, when they were written, it was over a period of time that they were compared with other gospels that were written. And, and the other Gospels did not line up with, with what those four, four Gospels taught. And people also, when they were written, people knew who the authors were. They knew Matthew. They knew Mark. They knew John. They knew Luke. They knew them. First-hand witnesses. So my, the book of Revelation was the last book in the New Testament to be written. And it was over a process of time that people realized, okay, this is the word of God. This is a part of the canon, the standard of the new covenant. So John says in verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Uh, verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. You know, verse 3, it give, this, it's, uh, it's what's referred to as the Beatitudes or a part of the Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. You've heard of the Beatitudes before? It's in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, and I won't go through them all, but it begins with blessed are the poor in spirit for there is the kingdom of heaven. And it closes with, blessed are those who are persecuted for, my, for righteousness' sake. So those, those are beatitudes. The word beatitudes means blessings. And this is one, of, this is one of, or a part of the, the beatitudes of the book of Revelation. Blessed is he who reads, those who hear, and those who keep. 
the words this prophecy. The word blessing in, in, uh, in verse 3 there, it, 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 is, uh, it, it, it means to abound with God's favor. Again, it means to, it's a Greek word, makarios, and it's the same word used in Matthew chapter, that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 5. It means to abound with God's favor, abound with the grace of God. So it's, I'll say it this way, so every believer, every child of God has God's grace. You can't be saved without it. Every child of God, every one of us has God's favor. Favor and grace is really the same idea. Grace is unmerited favor of God. The undeserved, unmerited, un, you can't earn it or work for it. And the, the makarios is, is a synonym of, of grace in that sense. It's a, but, it's, but it speaks of an abounding of God's favor. So we have God's favor, but there is an increase of God's favor. This is the idea. So there's an increase with God's favor to, to who? To those who read, those who hear, and those who keep. You know, when I taught the book Revelation for years, and it's, it's good to see Jennifer here. She took my Revelation class. She was a Bible college student, a very good one, by the way. She was, a, <laughs> she was a, uh, an RA for the girls for, I think, several years. And um, back in a long time ago, or I shouldn't, I shouldn't say a long time ago. Okay, okay. <laughs> it feels like yesterday, yeah. So but one of the things I used to say to the students, I would bring this out, that when we, as we go through this book this semester, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. And it has nothing to do with who's teaching it. It has to do with you, all of us. We're going to read, we're going to hear, and we're going to keep the words of this book. And I can say that to you. I can say that to you. As we read, and, and even, even if we don't understand all of it, and, it, and, and I'll, I will say this, and I, I kind of started it off by saying some people approach it as if we, we can't understand it, so I won't even touch it. There are things in the book of Revelation, definitely, that we don't understand. There are things about the end times that we don't understand. Does anybody know when the rapture will take place? No. But you know what? There, and there's a mystery behind that. But you know what? Without that, we wouldn't live by faith. Really, if we knew the exact date, and I'm just using this as an example, if we knew all the details of God's plan prophetically for the world, let's just, let's just say if we knew all the details for God's plan for our life, we would probably mess it up. Or we would try to fix it. We would try to fix the areas, the details of God's plan that we don't think are right. <laughs> I'm laughing because I know I would do that. <laughs> because I have a tendency, to, I want to fix things. Not just things, I want to fix people. You know? <laughs> and I'll use traffic, for example. You know, I always use traffic. You're in traffic, someone cuts you off. Oh, it happened the other day, I was on Medical Center Parkway, and someone just, I wasn't even in a lane, but someone just pulled out just right in traffic and had people just slam on the brakes and I'm thinking what are they thinking and in my flesh I'm like you know what they need to be corrected they need to be fixed <laughs> bless the Lord <laughs> but you know you learn and we learn the hard way you, you just can't you can't fix people in that way you can't fix the world in that way you can't even fix yourself in that way it's just, we're not, we, we can't. So my point is, if we knew all the details of God's plan, even for our own life, we would look at the details, the 10-year or 20-year, whatever details that we can see. I'm, I'm just theoretically speaking. God showed us all the details in the next five years of our life. We would look at it. Oh, man, well, nah, that, nah, nah like, I'm going to change that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manipulate that trial so I don't have to go through that trial. And, you know, I really don't like that person, and God's got me, you know, going to be around that person for a while. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manipulate God's plan this way so I'm not around that person. And we would try to fix it. But thank God he doesn't give us all the details. Hallelujah. 
Thank God. Because we wouldn't have to live by faith then. Really. We wouldn't have to, it wouldn't be a faith walk anymore. It would be, it would be us just as the master and the, and, the, and the manipulator of our life. And God doesn't want that. So when he says here, as I close here, blessed is he who reads, who hears, and those who keep. I, I, I think you understand the word reads and keeps, that's, this is, that's normal. It's plain. It reads and hears. The word keeps, though, speaks of, speaks of guarding. It speaks of protecting. It speaks of holding on to. And Sam, you can come back and, and live. Um, it speaks of guarding and protecting, holding on to, embracing. And as we go through the book of Revelation, again, we're not going to go through it line upon line, but we'll hit some highlights for the next, I don't know how many weeks. But I can tell you right now, based on the authority of God's word, that we are blessed when we do so. And you know who we're going to see? You know who we're going to see as we go through it? We're going to see Jesus. Hallelujah. We'll see Jesus. We'll see Jesus in chapter 1. We'll see Jesus in chapter 2. Jesus in chapter 3. We'll see Jesus in Revelation 13 with the seven heads and dragon with the seven heads. We'll see Jesus throughout it all. We'll see Jesus, of course, at the very end, coming back, riding on that white horse and you and I following him. Hallelujah. We'll see Jesus when he, buy, when, it, when, when, the, when he sends an angel to, and takes Satan and casts him into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. We'll see that. We'll see Jesus in that. We'll see Jesus in it all. Would you stand to your feet tonight? Hallelujah. You know, the Lord wants us to see Jesus. He does. He wants us to see Jesus like never before because when we see him and the eyes of our understanding are open, I tell you, that's when our life is changed. Praise the Lord. Day to day, our life has changed. Praise God. Father, tonight we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we have the privilege of knowing you and getting to see you, Lord, in your word. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. Have your way tonight, Lord. Have your way in our lives. And we say it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. And I want to touch you. the Lord. Hallelujah. Livy, will you close us in prayer tonight, please? God bless you tonight. Let me oh, I, let me make this announcement. I forgot to that. Uh, normally we have uh, we have prayer meeting on Saturday only. Saturday mornings at ten. This week we're gonna we're gonna have prayer meeting at thir on Thursday at ten a.m. So if you're able to make it Thursday at ten a.m. and um, and uh, this week we will not have prayer meeting on Saturday, but we will have it on Thursday at ten a.m. So. Um, if you're able to make it, please, uh, please do so. 
and uh, it's where we'll have a best time. We need we need to pray, amen. So God bless you, loving each other. We'll we'll see you. We'll see you later.